Hey guys, it's that magical time again. Time for some more Nano Ceph. In the last video, we had a little bit of a debugging detour, uh, and we tried we tried everything. We threw everything and the kitchen sink at it, and we came up with this, which we plug in, and we use this to build the executable. That's the secret sauce, and it lets you run it without crashing, which is always nice. Now, today, like I said, you know, three things that we wanted to accomplish. One, load from disk. Two, don't look like ass. Number three, we actually have to, you know, connect the front end with the C++ code. Otherwise, what the hell are we doing here? So that's what we're going to do today. Now, the front end, the JavaScript, that's run on a little boy called the V8 engine. Not the vegetable juice, not the engine configuration. So V8 is the damn thing that runs your JavaScript. And it's the thing that powers Chrome, Chromium, and also Node.js, which means it's it's running a lot of shit. It's kind of a big deal. So if we want to connect the front end logic, which is the, the JavaScript, right, to our C++, we need to interact with the V8 engine somehow. By the way, just in case you you feel icky about doing JavaScript, just look, it's written it's written in C++ V8, so it's it's all running on C++ in the end. It's all good. So if I were to ask you, how do we get at the V8? What's your first guess? If you guessed this boy right here, then you're right. It's not this one, because this one only has to do with the client stuff, which is like the the top level window that hosts all your shit. The app is where all the action is at. And one of the things in there is the render process. So we do like Ceph ref pointer, Ceph render process handler. Now, I, I think I mentioned this in a previous video, but it's kind of confusing. The render process is not about like rendering graphics per se um, it's about executing basically every damn thing that is on a web page so you know all the HTML CSS layouts and animation and all the JavaScript that all happens in the render process so it's like the most important one really so if we try get render process handler that that seems to be the right one I didn't even have to look that shit up and if I return this is going to be a little angry because this is not a render process handler. But, obviously, we can make it one. Okay, it is now a render process handler. But, now we need to override some render process handler functions, right? Some virtual boys, so that we can, you know, customize the behavior. Now, we want to get at the V8 engine. So, we need something that gives us the V8 engine. Go to definition is working today on Visual Studio, so that's a good day. On WebKit initiated, I don't know about that one. On browser created, on browser destroyed, on context creator gets us a Ceph V8 context. So we know, we already know it's on site. So on context created, it's gonna give us a pointer to the browser again. Uh, it's okay, we don't care about this. Who cares? Get out of my face. P frame. That's interesting, right? So. I don't think people use frames that much these days on web pages. A frame is an interesting topic. Only only 90s kids know about frames. Uh, if you're not familiar, you can put in the HTML code, you can put like an iframe or whatever. I don't know what it's called really. Uh, but you can show two separate web pages on the same view. And why would you want to do this? Well, I don't know, man. There used to be like a thing called a, a web ring where a bunch of different websites kind of banded together they would have a frame at the top whenever you visit one of them you would see a frame and then you could skip to the next one the next one independent of whatever you know site you're actually in you always had this frame here just chilling out making sure you don't get stuck or something i don't know man do people use these things anymore i i don't i don't really see them around but anyways uh the, the concept still exists so whenever you go to a page it is technically i guess within a frame and then that frame is going to have its own context. I think like every frame should have its own context. So you should be able to just get the, con yeah, you could get the V8 context from the frame. So this is, this is actually redundant, but whatever. It doesn't matter. We don't care. We don't care about the frame. We just want to get the context. So now we have the context. What do we, what do we do with it? Now we can screw around in the JavaScript world. So how do we get JavaScript to be able to interop with C++. Well, we can give the JavaScript world a function to call, and that will cause something to happen in the C++ side. So, 
let's inject a function. Now, to put it somewhere where we can get at it from the JavaScript code, I think the best, maybe the only place to put it is in the global namespace. It's going to rename this to the pv8 context because there's, there's so many contexts, right? Here we got another context initialized, but that's probably a different one. I don't know, man. pv8 context pointer to. Now we want to get the global. So I think, yeah, there's just a function called get global. That's nice. And it's a V8 value, which is basically like a JavaScript value. If you don't know, JavaScript can be like a string, a number, a bool, null, or an object. And an object can just, it's just like a hat. It's kind of like a struct, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a hash table of string to another JavaScript value which again could be any of the ones I just listed. So we get the global object and on this we want to set a new value, a new key value pair basically. So we will set value. That's got to be the name of the function and it's going to be do chili. All right, so what kind of value is it? Well, set v8 value and we're going to create, well, besides the ones I mentioned, there's also function. We want to create a function. All right, now, a little jank, but the function name has its own name besides the name that goes on the object. I think they have to match. I don't know. I, I wouldn't make them different, but you can you can test that out if you want. So we give it a the name of the function, and then we give it a handler, a Ceph V8 handler. Now the handler is gonna have a function that gets called whenever we try to execute this function. So in the JavaScript world, whenever we actually try to execute this function that we've injected, that is going to cause the handler's function to be executed. It's gonna cause some C++ code to be executed. Now, we need some, we need a Ceph v8 handler. So of course, NanoCeph app is also gonna be the Ceph v8 handler. <laughs> ah, this is perfect. This is perfect software architecture for sure but it's, it's good for us because it means less typing probably now can we go to this one now this one is not allowed of course S silly chili why would you ever think okay what if we go to ceph v8.h ah on line 231 we have ceph v8 handler and it only has one function on it execute so this is the thing that will get called whenever the JavaScript function that we injected is executed. So we need this. So now we can pass this in as a handler and that's all good. Now the th third thing you need is a property attribute. So we don't want any of that shit. So just do v8 property attribute none. But I think you could do like read only or I don't know some other stuff like that. I don't know. We don't we don't obviously we don't care about that. So this is all you need to put that function onto the JS side and now they should be able to execute it. But we need to write what happens when they execute it. So when they execute it, this is gonna, we're gonna come into this function. Name is the name of the function that was executed because you could use the same handler. You could, you know, put it in multiple different functions and then you probably wanna know which one was actually called. So you could do that with the name. Then there's Ceph V8 value. That is the object that it was executed on, which I guess this will give us the global object, I imagine. Um, but here, value list. So these are the arguments. That's a list of V8 values. This is probably pretty important. And also return value. So we can return a value once the function finishes executing. And if we want to throw an exception, we could set this to you know, a non-empty string and then it would cause an execution to be thrown with that string. I guess you're limited to only throwing string ex exceptions, not like any particular type that you want, but whatever. That's good enough, I guess. So for our little test here, we're just going to make a message box appear. Message box. We'll just use a little Windows API function to make a native message box appear when the JavaScript calls this. Now we don't really have access to the Windows handle for the window. We'll just use no pointer for the window. It works fine either way. Uh, now the text. Let's rename this to arg pointers because this is a basically a list of pointers. And we're going to do arg pointers at zero. We're just going to assume that there's one element in this list. And that element, we're going to assume that it is a string. 
get string value. So that's a Ceph string and then dot C string. So now we can pass in the actual string that's going to go into the message box. What's your poem? Ah, you don't, you're a, you're a wide boy. I see, two string. And the title will just be Henlo, we'll just make that fixed. And let's just add a little, a little spice to our message box. We'll make it system modal. I think that'll make it come up to the front so it won't be hidden first time it pops up. And we'll, uh, we'll give it a little icon of a question mark. And we'll give it some buttons, like a yes, no, cancel kind of deal. Now if we do this, the return value should indicate which button was actually pressed. So let's do, and I mean, it it's probably could also indicate an error or whatever, but we're not going to worry about that. So we'll do the message box, and then we'll say retval is equal to, I gotta make it, I gotta make it a P. You know my fetish. Pret is equal to Ceph V8 value. Create string. Std to string ret. There we go. So we'll convert this int to a string. Create a Ceph V8 string for that, and that'll be our return value. Now this thing returns a bool. I'll be honest with you, I don't really know what the hell that means. So we return true if the execution was handled. I don't know what happens if you don't handle it, but I mean, we're going to handle it, so let's return true. Okay, so there you go. This should enable us to make a message box appear now if we were to invoke this from the JavaScript side. So let's just make sure it builds. All right, let's create a function here. Function do it. And do it is going to call our API function. Now, the function that we want to call is called do chili in the global namespace. And you should give it a, uh, a string like that. Now, there's a problem with this. TypeScript actually checks to see like whether the things you're trying to access actually exist. And it doesn't know about do chili because we just made it the F up. So we got to tell it about do chili. So there's a bunch of ways you could do this, but a nice clean way would be. We're going to do an interface, and we'll call it the chill API. Chill API objects that adhere to the chill API interface have a function called do chili that takes in a string. They return void. Now, the global object, you can refer to it as window for whatever reason. That's what you can refer to it as. So. Let's do const chill API. So there's a chill API object. And that's actually just window. But, I mean, obviously, window is not this of this interface, right? It doesn't make any goddamn sense. We gotta say window as chill API. So, like, recast this as chill API. Trust me, bro. It's got this interface. Oh, no, it don't like it. It's saying it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't have that interface. I know what window is. This ain't it. So we gotta say no. You don't know, actually, you don't know what window is. And then let me tell you, it's this. And then it works fine. So I usually do this like once. Like I'll, I'll define chill API and I'll have all of my endpoints in here. And then at I'll have one function that just lets me get the global window as my interface. And then I just use that everywhere else. But uh, we'll just keep it simple here. Chill API, and now we can call do chili, and TypeScript is not going to throw a hissy fit. So let's create, let's put a little button on here. Put a button right after our add item button here. And this one's just a normal button with the text do it. Or uh, the text I think is click, and when you, or the text is A, and when you click on it, it will execute the function do it. All right, moment of truth. Let's run it. We should at least see the button, right? There's the button. It says A. If we click it, oh, there it is. A la mao. Now, there's going to be a little problem you might notice. When this is up, you cannot interact with the page. That's not intended. Remember, we didn't give it the, the handle to the window, so it's not like it's modal and it's preventing you. The reason why... We can't. And here you go. Here you have it. Page unresponsive. So you probably don't want this to pop up on your app. 
at any time. But uh, we'll, we'll wait. You can see we can still interact with this part of the application. So it's not like the mobile. The, you see, we can still interact with this part of the application. So you know that it's not the modal that's blocking us. It's something else. You know, if we wait here and then we go, yes, then it works fine. Everything works after that. So what's the problem here? Because this is not how we want to live our life. Well, you know what? I'm not going to tell you what the problem is. I'll let you think about it. Because uh, that's what we're going to do in the next video. But before I finish this one up, I just want to flesh it out just a bit to prepare for the next video. So we're getting this return value. We're setting it here. I want to use it. So let me put this uh, this paragraph in here after our button. Yeah, we'll, we'll give it the price so that it's a little bigger so it shows up. We need some reactive data. We'll do MB is equal to ref. And I guess it should just be a string, maybe? Yeah, we just made it a return a string. I don't know why I made this a string. Why don't I just like do create int and then I can just give it the ret directly. Yeah, that makes more sense. I don't know why I did that, honestly. So we'll create this reactive data. The type is number or null. So it's a nullable number, initially null. And in do it, we're going to call do chili and mb.value is going to be equal to the return value of do chili, which is not void. This returns a number as previously established. And then down here, we're going to output mb. But if mb is null, then we're just going to output an empty string. Or we could just output null, I don't know, whatever. I guess the dollar sign is a little weird, but whatever. So if we click the yes, that's six. OK, yes is six. No is seven. And cancel is two. What if we click the X? That's also two. All right. So it's two, six, and seven. Do you remember that? All right. All right, so a little digging into the docs. Let me know that this is, there's actually defined symbols for those numbers that we just looked up. So we're going to change the behavior a little bit. If the return value is cancel, then we're going to make that an exception. And that means that now, if it's not canceled, we can just return a boolean value. True is yes, false is no. So now our function returns bool, and this is going to be a nullable bool. Uh, it's boolean in JavaScript. Very fancy. All right, that looks good to me. Could do like a try catch in here. So we'll set that value back to null if we get an exception when we do this. And then down here, we're going to output mb. Let me see here. If mb is equal to, if mb is true, we say yes. Otherwise, if mb is not null, we're going to no. Otherwise, we're going to null. Ha! Ha! Oh, this is an abomination. But uh, yeah, this should probably be a computed, but I don't give a IDGAF. Come on, let's send it. I still got the dollar sign there. All right, so we do this. Yes is a yes. No is a no. Cancel is back to null. All right, so it works. It's beautiful. That's working. Of course, there's a problem of causes the the whole program to become unresponsive. That's a problem for future Chili. Until then, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please click the like button. It helps a lot. And I will see you again with some more Nano Ceph.